Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 11th episode of Insecurity. Today, we have a really special episode. It's not because it's Christmas. And yes, we are recording on Christmas because security doesn't take a break. But we're talking about something we've spoken about for the last 10 weeks, which is two-factor authentication. So I, we have Tom Webster here, and he's going to explain it all to us. How's, how's it going, Tom? Pretty good. A little busy with the holidays, but everything is starting today to settle down which is good. So we talk about two-factor authentication. We say we should enable it, but I guess finally we need to talk about actually what that means and how to do it and why it's great and then the pitfalls with it. Yeah. So what is two-factor authentication? Um, to, to put it the, in the most simple way I can, um, to log into your account today without two-factor authentication, if you're just logging in normally, you have to have something you know, a username and a password. And the username is usually public. So it's really just one thing you know, which is your password. So two-factor authentication means having more than just something you know. It could also be uh, something you have or, in some cases, something else you know, but that's not really two-factor authentication. The two-factor authentication we're going to talk about today is something you have and something you know. And it can either be a, uh, a nice you know, security device like this, uh, this YubiKey here, or these pair of YubiKeys, um, or it could be a series of random numbers, such as uh, this, Google Authenticator. And um, I'll show the, the Google Play store link so you know which one to get. Um, but what it does in practice is when somebody, if somebody steals your password, if, they, if you're using the name of your dog as a password, and somebody's trying to log into your account, they can look, and it, uh, it gets them into your account, but then the website pops up and says, hey, we need your two-factor authentication code, at which point they're foiled because they don't have your phone or your YubiKey. What you have to do is you take these random numbers, you plug it into the site, and then you get logged in. It means that a would-be hacker or a thief has got to steal your password as well as your phone or YubiKey or other two-factor authentication device. It keeps things really, really safe, and it's honestly the best way to guard yourself against phishing attacks. Well, I, let's just get the big, uh, the big problem out of the room. What happens if you don't have one of these devices? Like, let's say you're logging in and then you don't have your phone. Right. Um, you can do, depending on the website, you can either set a computer as trusted, and most banks do this, where a bank will send you a text message and says, hey, here's your authentication code. Put this in when we ask for it. Um, and if you don't have your phone, you can't log in. Um, with some banks and some systems, it allows you to, LastPass is one of these, it allows you to mark a computer as trusted. It says, look, I trust this machine. If this machine tries to log on, it's going to give you this special cookie transparently. I'm not going to need to do anything extra. But you're not going to require two-factor authentication. Um, there's also a... Uh, a series of codes you can print out, offline codes that are one-time use only. You can just type in one of those codes, cross it off your list, and it lets you in even if you don't have your phone. Well, what happened was, with all the hacks that were going on last year and the year before, the first, the big site to take care of this was Google. I think Google really started it. Yeah. I mean, I think PayPal way before that started, but Google really got into the habit. They made all the videos, and we'll post those show uh, those videos in the show notes. And they tried to make it as easy as possible. They did. They they showed you how to do it. They showed you how to install it, and they showed you where to go. And I think a lot of people started turning it on. And one week after that, you talk to anybody, and what did they do? They turned it off. And they basically turned it off because here's the thing. They need their phone. I'm sitting upstairs. My phone is charging downstairs. So now I have two choices, not get my email or go downstairs. So you go downstairs once. You go downstairs twice. You go downstairs three times. And then you start saying, this is a real pain. Everywhere you go, you need the second factor. But if you're, true, if you're thinking about security, thinking about it, don't think of it that way. Think about it as, hey, look, 
this is the length I have to go to to be safe because somebody else is not going to go through that length, that those uh, those lengths, and they're just deciding to, you know what? I forgot, but they just didn't want to do it. If it's not that important, if you're not willing to jump through hoops to protect it, right? And and the, that's honestly when you start thinking about security and manners of wow, this is really, really inconvenient for me to grab my phone, grab my keys, my YubiKey, uh, and, and log on with these uh, with this other device, um, start thinking about it in this way. Start thinking, you know, if somebody stole my password today, they would also have to grab my phone or my YubiKey. They would have to jump through the same hoops and be just as annoyed as I am, and chances are that hacker in Russia isn't going to break into my house to steal my Android phone because he just won't care. It makes me a much harder target. The safe is way harder to drill into for my account than it is someone else's account. He's going to move on and attack someone else instead. With security, it's a lot of security is mitigation. Um, you take the effort, you, you make it so you have to jump through these hoops, so somebody will look at that and say, God, this is gonna, this is a hard guy to hack. Unless you specifically are targeted, that would-be attacker is going to move on to someone else. I hate to say this, but if you have two-factor, not that we recommend it, but your password, your password that you choose doesn't necessarily have to be crazy long and very complicated because you have to enter that second factor. The only downside of that, just to be just just to play both sides, is that you can't do the trust my computer all the time. Because if you're going to trust yeah. your computer all the time and you have a really simple password, well, then we have a problem. However, if you always put your six-digit code in, you theoretically could make your password shorter and easier to remember. And and then it's you still got to put the six-digit code in, but you know that you're a little bit you're safer that way. Right, and, and like you said, it's really Google who kicked this whole thing off. The, uh, the app you're going to want to download, and we'll throw this in the show notes at the end, um, is Google Authenticator, and you can find that in the Google Play Store, um, in uh, the Apple App Store. It's There are open source versions of the Google Authenticator just about everywhere. Um, and like, the, like I showed you before, all it does is generate a six-digit code, a six-digit number, that you type into a website. When Google introduced this, it was at a time when two-factor authentication was difficult. It was, hey, I've got to carry an extra, you know, RSA tokens were big for this. I've got to carry an extra dongle, and that piece of hardware expires in three years, and then I've got to go buy another one, and I've got to keep it on my keychain and look at it and type it in, and it gets really annoying because you've got to have this physical device that can't move phones with you. It, you can't you know, package it up and, and back it up anywhere. Um, so it got really annoying. So Google said, okay, we're just going to make our own app. We're going to make a standard, and we're going to ship this out to everyone for free. And the initial pieces of the code are open source. So people, if you want to build your own, if you're building a website, you can, it, you can support Google Authenticator. It's really easy. And for you at home, the app is free. So if you're going to protect any account, your Google account is probably the most important. You can also protect, oh, let, let, me, let me see what I've got here. Uh, there's a couple banks that use this. Um, there's GitHub if you do stuff with code. Dropbox is really popular. LastPass uses this. Um, there's a giant list of sites that have two-factor authentication built in that we're going to put in the show notes. You know, stuff like Bank of America or, uh, you know, Box, if you're using that for cloud backups, sort of a file locker service. Tons of places use two-factor authentication. And really, you should enable it for any site you really care about. Anything you absolutely can't have hacked, you need two-factor authentication. Well, like we said, Google really... Uh whipped everyone into shape. The only problem that that happens now is that every some of these companies want to build their own two-factor uh, type of mechanism. Because what started happening, the banks started getting on this bandwagon and they said, we'll text message you uh, the code. So it worked for a little bit and then, and then again, you still needed your phone. 
whether whether you had service, whether you didn't have service, whatever it was, you needed your phone and it had to be connected to some sort of data network. Uh, the good thing about Google Authenticator is that you didn't need to have that. It, it's time-based, so as long as you connect every once in a while, you're good. Then other companies said, well, we don't really want to use Google Authenticator, so again, they made their own. Facebook is another prime example. Mm -hmm. They have their own code generator in there. Blizzard Only after, Warcraft. yeah, Blizzard had their dongle, PayPal had their dongle, and but now at least people are starting to see maybe we should start moving towards this open source open source authenticator. And as soon as it did, a whole a whole list of websites popped up, and and just about anything you can think of to be secure is in fact there, which is a good thing. I'm going through this list and I'm actually impressed. Yeah, it's it's not really a rare thing anymore. Back when uh, when Google Authenticator first came out, you know, Google used it, and then a couple little indie websites implemented it, yeah, you know, real quick. But it wasn't anyone big like like GoDaddy is listed in here, or LinkedIn, or Mailchimp, or PayPal, or I, you can go down this list. There's a lot of people that have this. Twitter has it now. Um, if you run but Twitter, you know the way blog. Twitter does it. You know the way Twitter does it, which is really weird. No. Twitter does it in a way you have to use their app. And what they do is they is they have login verification to the specific Twitter app. So it does it okay. in a way that Twitter doesn't hold the time based database, which is really which is a really nerdy thing. It doesn't hmm. hold it, but the Twitter app client authenticates against himself. The problem is you gotta use the Twitter uh, app, which I've been trying to use, and and I've been always going back to any one of the better third-party apps because they're st they're still throwing some weird like Twitter spam in there. Like I get yeah. random uh, followers. These three people followed this other person. We think you should follow them, and it's a notification, and it and yeah. and you turn it off. But and then so you set up your one verification. Uh, app and then all the other things have to verify against it which is pretty cool in the sense that you don't have to put in any codes but it's really annoying that you're stuck using their app right um, there were other forms of two-factor authentication that Google has experimented with Google Sesame being kind of this mystical magical one that uh, no one really talks about unless you're talking to security guys about really cool experiments um, what Google Sesame was is Google said, okay, all right, we know you have an Android phone, right? You've got a phone, you've logged on to Google services on your phone, so this device is trusted, right? You trust this, it's your phone. But let's say you sit down at a library. You don't know if somebody's got a USB dongle plugged into the keyboard port that's collecting your keystrokes and reading your passwords. You don't know if this machine has got viruses, spyware, key loggers, you know, all this stuff that can grab your password and log right into your Google account. You, you don't know. This machine could be completely compromised. How can you log into your Google account safely on a completely compromised machine? And the answer was QR codes. You would click Open Sesame and a QR code would pop up. You would scan that QR code with your trusted Google phone, open it up on your already authenticated browser on your phone. So your phone is now going to a link. So your phone does have to be online. The phone goes to a link and it, the web page pops up and says, hey, this computer at this IP address is trying to log on to your Google account. Click yes to allow them to log on to your account. And you're sitting there and you know it shows you know a code on the screen and a code on your phone. If they match, you hit go, and it will log you in. Then your login page magically on the computer would just change, and you would be automatically logged in. No usernames, no passwords, nothing for the bad guys to collect. Just a QR code you scan, and that's it. It's a really great system, and uh, there's there's a couple other systems in the works. Steve Gibson has got a great. Um, a great, I want to say authentication system, but it does so much more than that. Um, without passwords, without usernames, that's going to be an HTML5 standard. It's going to be huge. It's called Squirrel. Um, that looks really good. It's still a little too technical to talk about on the podcast, and it's not really used many places yet. Well, I wanted to go through how does one let's let's take Google or Gmail for example. How, what sh, what are the pitfalls? How should some how should someone set it up easily, without getting locked out of their account? Let's try and figure this out. 
Yeah. Um, so the first step, the absolute first step, and I can't believe I'm saying this, have a printer. Um, I hate printers. I hate physical paper. I hate putting information on pieces of paper. I just don't like it. It doesn't sit well with me. Um, but when you go to accounts.google.com, there's a security tab. You click on that. You hit enable two-factor authentication. It says, okay, all right, we're going to do some two-factor stuff. Do you want it in text message form, which is a decent option, or do you want it in application form, which is a fantastic option? If you've got a BlackBerry, if you've got iPhone, Windows phone, uh, Android phone, if you've got some type of decently smartphone, um, you should be able to get a Google Authenticator compatible application for free because these are always put out for free. So you log in or you, you get the app on your phone and it shows you a QR code on the, on the screen. You scan that and it says, okay, you scanned it. Go ahead and type in the, the six-digit code you see right there on your phone. You tap that in and it says, okay, cool, you're good. Now, here's a set of ten backup codes. Print them out put them in a safe, lock them in a vault, take them to a safety deposit box, whatever you do, don't lose these. Laminate it, put it in your wallet, something. Just make sure you have these codes. These are your backup codes. I want to and also add, do, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. I want to mm -hmm. add specifically with Google. If you're like me who moves from phone to phone, uh, it's hard you, what you have to do then is deregister, which we'll get to in a second, but right. you can't just switch from phone to phone. They don't print up that barcode. So if you know how to do a screenshot or print out that page and in, attach that with your 10 digit, your 10 backup codes, because you're going to want that if you're the type of person that moves from phone to phone, because yeah. otherwise you're going to have to do the whole thing again. And one of the cool things we didn't even mention with this Google Authenticator app, you can put this on your, your phone, your iPad, your Nexus tablet, whatever you want, assuming those are also secure. So you just don't need to be limited to your phone. If you have a backup phone, you could probably leave that upstairs with you instead of going up and down and all this other stuff. But to ha you need that QR code on that phone. And people didn't realize this. It's something so simple. You just take a picture with another device and you have yeah. it. But if you lose that picture, Google in particular, you can't get it back and you've got to do the whole process again. And if you're like me with OCD, you want the same, the first spot to be your Gmail, your second spot to be LastPass, your third spot to be Dropbox, and so on and so right. on. So print that code out. And that said, you should, always, you should treat that QR code like you treat your password printed out in plain text. That is a cryptographic secret. That is something that someone can take that and impersonate your two-factor authentication. So if I've got it on you know, my tablet and I've got it on my phone and they're sharing the same code and I lose my tablet, my tablet is stolen from my car one day after I walk into work. It's tragic. You have to deregister everything. You've got to go to Google, log into your account and say, hey, I need a new QR code. I need to deregister all the two-factor devices and reset up one because that device, that code, that two-factor authentication mechanism is now completely compromised. Same thing is if you print out your backup codes and your QR code and you know you, you lose them. You, you have a you know, tiny fire safe and somebody breaks into your house and takes it. You need to treat that as compromised at that point. Destroy the two-factor authentication link. It's easy to turn it off. Just turn it off, turn it back on, and you'll have completely fresh credentials that Google will hand you to say, here's a brand new QR code. Scan this. We'll get you all set up and get you all set up with 10 new backup codes. Um, the more devices you put it on, the greater your risk of losing control of it is. So be careful. It's not really something to totally worry about unless you're the kind of person that leaves your phone all over the place where it can get stolen. So just, just be mindful of that. One thing I've seen is if you take a screenshot of the QR code, use something like, like 7-Zip or put it into an encrypted archive, a TrueCrypt volume, and, and store that on Dropbox somewhere or Google Drive or somewhere else where you can get it, somewhere that it's encrypted and only you can read it. And that way, if something's stolen, you just go there, decrypt it with your password, and then you've got all your codes and you can get everything set up again. All right, then you're absolutely right because 
Um, I mean, the other thing you can do is if you have a passcode on your phone or your other device, you can completely reformat that using, at least on Android, the Android Device Manager or the Apple uh, Find My iPad or Find My iPhone. But again, if you lose control of those six digits of your uh, Google Authenticator, you do need to remove all traces of it and reset it up. But again, again, it's easier to do that once than having to worry about whether your credit cards were stolen in the target breach and the username and password and having to go through the entire list and everything else. But again, we're, what we're saying here is once you put that six-digit code on, Google can't help you recover that password. You have to be very cognizant of what you do with this. That's why I think they almost require you to, to actually print out the backup codes or to acknowledge that you've done you've written them down or have done something with them because they can't help you I mean they could uh, it looks like you can go back to the phone number but other than that you need if you lose that app you basically get locked out of your Gmail account right Google gives you a couple different back doors in order to get in but you've got to set these up and they will prompt you and they'll hound you you know every three months Google says hey is this information correct? When I log on to Gmail, they say, hey, look, you have got this as your backup email address. Is that good? Yes, that's okay. Okay, you've got this phone number, this one right here. That's your backup phone number. Is that correct? So, yeah, that's okay. And if you get locked out of your account, like really badly locked out of your account, like you, you went to LastPass, you changed your Gmail password to something random, and all of a sudden you can't log into LastPass, or you cancel LastPass or you delete your accounts or something happens and you lose complete control of your Gmail account, you say, ah, I need a password reset and I had two-factor authentication. They're going to contact you through that backup email address. They're going to give you a phone call on your backup phone number and you need to make sure those things are set and more importantly, you need to make sure they're correct because if they aren't, your accounts are gone. Um, and people have, there, there have been varying successes with people either not being able to get back into their Google accounts or Google, you know, someone from Google taking notice and saying, hey, this guy's legit. We're going to go ahead and get him his access back. So be vigilant and uh, keep your backups. We only say this because this is not something that you can do in 10 minutes. Take your time. Sit down. If you're off this week, if you're off over one of the weekends, sit down, write down what you're doing just in case. You want to make sure, go, before you turn it on, go through all the settings. Find your backup your backup email, make sure that works, make sure you can get it, uh, make sure all the phone numbers are right, have them test it, all these things, only because if you're locked out, you are locked out. And right. And this goes across. Google is easier because, like I said, they have all these other th stuff. But LastPass is not. LastPass, because they're supposed to be secure and trust no one, all they can do is give you a password hint. I don't think they can. Uh, they can do. They can reset your account. I don't think there's anybody you can call to they, verify who you are. They can turn off two-factor authentication, but they will send you an email confirmation, and you have to click that link in email to reset that with your master password. Oh, okay. Well, that's a, that's a good thing. It's always good right. to have a backdoor that's that's somewhat easy but somewhat difficult. Right. And in backups, I mean, even if you're using cloud services, you're like me. You use just about everything on the cloud, everything at all. Um, so what I do is I make sure I keep all my data secure and all my data in my hands where I can grab it. So I've got Google Drive syncing to a local computer. So if Google Drive disappears overnight, I've still got my data. It's not totally lost out there in the ether. Um, with LastPass, I've got an encrypted backup of everything in my LastPass vault, and that's stored on my machine, and that's stored in my backups. Um, with my Google account, I'm synchronizing Gmail to Thunderbird, and I'm making sure Thunderbird stores everything offline. Yeah, it's a lot of data. It's 10 gigs of email. and Do I really need to keep it? Probably not, but... You know, if Gmail goes away tomorrow, or worst case, if I lose control of my account, I've still got that email. Absolutely, and like, and then the last part of this is all those backup codes. So we told you to print out those backup codes. What are they used for? And you touched on it, but again, all these websites will give you some 16-character hex code or whatever it is. That's in case you're out 
and you you lose your phone, you lose this, you can't get in, it's for those codes. And they're supposed to be put away somewhere difficult to reach. Something where you actually have to call somebody, call your wife, call your significant other and say, hey, can you go into my drawer and get this code? This is going to get me into my account. And once you get in, you can decide what you want to do from there. But it's supposed to be difficult for someone to get, but not so difficult that it's impossible. Right. What I do is I put all of these in a LastPass secure note, and then I print out the LastPass secure note one. So I only have that one thing. Yeah, but that's yeah, me. That's, that's a great idea. Um, one thing to so we're we're talking about two factor authentication, and it we've probably scared you away from it because it sounds like a lot of work. And I'm not going to lie to you; it is a lot of work. It's a change in in what you know on a daily basis of hey, I need to log into this service or log into this account. Now I'm going to add this totally new thing, screw up my workflow, and it's just a pain. It's a complete pain to have to do this each and every time I log in. But honestly, let's say somebody hits you with a phishing page. And I saw a really, really great phishing page a couple days ago. A family member showed it to me and I said, hey, is this legit? I said, no, but that looks really, really good. It was a PayPal page. And if they didn't have two-factor authentication and they were just to log on, their PayPal account would be completely compromised, utterly compromised, because they didn't have two-factor authentication. It's a good thing they came to me first and they said, hey, but what if I did? How do I save myself in case I put my password somewhere where I shouldn't? I said, well, we're going to set up PayPal's two-factor authentication. Let's get started. And it did. It changed their entire workflow, but it really keeps you safe. It's the best thing you can do for security for online accounts. And remember, th we've, we've dealt with the hard part of it where every computer, every single time, you can choose to set your desktop to automatically remember this. If you're the type of person you're only using your desktop and has a strong password and you lock it every time, go ahead, set your computer at home to do it. But when you're out in public, obviously make sure you uncheck that box because it's on, unfortunately, by default, at least on Google. Just to say, hey, every time you have to do it, you're out in public anyway. You have your phone, you have your wallet, you have all this stuff. It shouldn't be that hard to pull it out and, and if it's not already out and open the app and type it in. Right. It's the only the only annoying thing is if you're trying to let's say log in to something on your phone and you have to switch apps and everything else. But again, again, it's the little bit of inconvenience just to be uh, very safe because we you saw Target had lost their stuff. Uh, you get you get uh, LinkedIn losing stuff again. You you're getting Twitter, Facebook, and all these other places losing stuff. They're going after you and to say. And to say, hey, uh, put in your six-digit code, no one's going to do it. They can't find you, and it only lasts for 30 seconds. So they need to do it within 30 seconds. Yeah, could, could you imagine? So if credit cards took two-factor authentication codes, where I had to put in a randomly generated six-digit number every time you swiped a credit card, if Target lost all the credit cards in the world and they continued losing them, this wouldn't really matter. Well, I mean, that's the, would be the, bad. the pin. That's what the pin is. I think in Europe they were talking about it. Everywhere mm -hmm. in Europe you have to chip and pin, I guess. You have to you have to swipe the credit card, and then you have to put in, like the debit card, a four-digit pin. So yeah. if you lost it, there's nothing you can do. The credit card companies want zero friction. They want you to use it. So to, ha to put in a four- or six-digit pin will be too difficult. So they take the liability. But think about now you have to cancel your card, and all the hassle it was to switch all your prepaid stuff over. It's just, it's, you might as well work it into your workflow to the point that you're not thinking about it. Right. Yeah, it's, it's way easier not to lose control in the first place. And that's why you need to do the two-factor authentication now while you're safe because there will come a day when you will get fished. It's happened to me. It's, you know, you click on a link and it looks totally legit and you start typing something in and it's like, hold on a minute. That's a zero, not a no. Because it's happened to all of us. We've all seen really great phishing sites. And honestly, it's not the Nigerian print scam. It's not easy stuff anymore. These are really, really, really good scams. Or, you know, a malicious app that says, hey, we're going to, you know, scan your Google Drive and put pictures of kittens in every presentation for you automatically. 
Awesome. I love that. That's a great app ID. Here, just let me log into. Oh, wait a minute. They're trying to get my password. And so it's it's not a rare thing anymore. Phishing attacks are getting very sophisticated, and they're happening to everyone now. Well, like I said, let's we we all want you to be safe. Now we spoke about two-factor authentication. Uh, go play with it. If you have a couple days off, try it on one account first. Try it on one account. Don't go. Don't go crazy because you will, you will, you may end up reverting back. So start slow, one account, and when you're comfortable, go to a second account, and then when you're really ready, then put it on everything. Don't worry. The sooner the better, but as long as you put it on, you'll be fine. And with that, our time's up. So until next week. Have fun. Hey, okay, bye, guys.